Welcome everyone to another episode of Pints with Air. I'm Bryn Hefley, Sales and Marketing Director. I'm here with Ariel Brown, our VP and Senior Engineer, Brian Berry, our CEO and Expert Technician, and Dustin Foreman, our special guest from ESS this week. So cheers, everyone. Cheers. cheers. And I have to say we're cheersing this week with uh, our new Pints with Air pint glasses. So. We're all really psyched about those. Something fun to get excited over in uh, February of 2021. Um, While well, we're still in semi lockdown in a lot of places in the world. Um, hopefully we'll have some of these up on the, uh, the air store in the next month. So if you wanna get your own special edition and uh, you can check back there for it. Um, plated so, ones? What's that? There's some gold plated ones? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. You get some, uh, some, you, you, they, they're, they come in pairs, obviously, because they're balanced, right? So, right. <laughs> um, we'll have that going for us, but, uh, it's great. It great for resting your cables on to make them sound better. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. All audio systems sound better after a pint. Uh, well, so what, uh, what did you guys fill your pint glasses with there in Colorado today? What do you, what did you pull out of the fridge? So, uh, I'm store it. Um, we got uh, one of the probably oldest Colorado microbrews, which is not so micro anymore. New Belgian, yeah. their triple Belgian ale. Awesome. Um, they've been making this for many, many years. Yeah. Still, it is just a really solid, relatively strong, but really delicious. Yeah, a triple Belgian will keep you, go keep you going all afternoon. That's right. Nice, nice. Dustin, what did you, uh, what did you break out there in uh, BC? I went uh, just across the street from where our office is to uh, it's a little microbrewery, quite small, nice. called mm. uh, Copper Brewing, and it's a uh, it's a nut brown ale. So I've had it a couple nice. times before. It's quite nice. Yeah, I love nut brown ales. I'll have to try that because I the, there's one I forget the brewery name, but there's one from Northern California that I always liked. Um, but uh, with Copper Copper River Brewing, I'll have to keep that one in in mind. I went with uh, with a little bit uh, back to the IPA realm today with the uh, the F bomb <laughs> IPA uh, from Stickman Brewing, which is up just outside of Portland in Tualatin, uh, Oregon. Little little brewery up there, but they make some uh, some great beers with some pretty creative uh, creative names and graphics. I love it, as you all know. Absolutely. So. All right. Well, it's it's always fun to have a great guest, and uh, you know we've known Dustin for quite a while. We've been working with ESS for quite a you know decade now. Yeah, yeah. Look back. I think we probably started working about 2012. I mean, we released our first the QB9 upgrade in early 2013. So we were working on it probably a year before that. So sometime in 2012, I think is when we started. Yeah. And working pretty closely with Dustin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah. Um, Dustin, do you want to start out and kind of just give us a little bit of ESS lore and, and uh, what's going on? You're based in British Columbia. The main headquarters is in San Jose. And um, Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give a kind of an overview for you guys where right. ESS started and how, how this whole office in Kelowna in British Columbia, Canada came about. Um, so it was founded back in the early 80s and it uh, started out as a company that was doing little music chips that would go inside the spine of the Disney books. And when you open up the book and press the cow, it would go moo and, you know, <laughs> of nice. and then there was also some other little sound kind of devices like a uh, remote control car. They put little sound chip in these remote control cars, which were wired back then. When you press forward, you'd hear the gas kind of ooh, and then back up, they do beep, beep, beep kind of things. And so there was, um, you know, some sound chips to start off with. And ESS um, originally meant Esonic Sound Systems. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of has morphed over the years. But uh, that's as, that's the story I got um, about uh, how it started. And I believe that was around 84. Excellent. Later on, the audio progressed into PC audio. So they started doing Sound Blaster um, equivalents. And that went into laptops, Dell, HP type laptops, integrating this effectively the sound blaster into their, um, into a single chip and then putting them inside those platforms. And so that brought it into the nineties 
And then, um, and then after that, it went into the DVD days. And the DVD days were the uh, kind of the big growth days. The company went public on the NASDAQ. It, um, that took it through the 90s to the, into the 2000s. And then um, how the office in Kelowna here, Canada started was um, my mentor, Martin Mallinson, who um, lived in Kelowna. He, was, uh, he did a contract job for ESS. And what came out of that, he was an analog designer. What came out of that is that at that time, they decided to try hire him and he really didn't want to move. Um, his, he had young kids at the time and everything. So what happened was, is they decided to start an office around them. And I was um, hire number, I think number two in that office as a summer student. I was in second year engineering. And um, that was back in That's familiar. 2001. <laughs> That's so, a great summer job. Yeah, and I've never had a different job. I was here for at, in summer student in year two, and then they brought me back in year three and then told me, don't bother taking a master's, come back as soon as you're done. That's familiar too, doesn't it, Ariel? Yeah. <laughs> so I did, and, and I've been here ever since. So, um, and then what happened was the DVD, D, or the DVD days kind of turned into soundbar days, and um, Netflix came along and you know, we, we kind of went into Blu-ray a little tiny bit, but never really fully because Blu-ray never, as a medium, never really took off because of the streaming that was looming around the uh, mid-2000s. And in those DVD days is where the audio DAC products were really born. What we started doing is we were putting Class D amplifiers embedded into the DVD chips for the home theater in a box. And so they wanted to integrate everything into one chip, they being the customers that we were selling our, our players to, um, or the chips that ran in their players, I should say. And so out of that development, doing class D hype, what we called hyperstream, um, there was a patent around what the hyperstream was, and it, but that effectively was a class D modulator. Um, as time went on, they wanted to add line outs to the DVD players. So we took the hyperstream and modified it to be more of a, instead of just a class D with two levels, we did a multi-level and that multi-level kind of, at first it was a 16 level multi-level and then we moved it to 32 and then we moved it to 64 throughout um, the, I guess the development of that technology. And then one day about 2005, uh, the Kelowna group decided to say, well, let's make a standalone one standalone uh, multi-level hyperstream and in those days that's what it was called and so we made a chip and that was the 9002 the 9002 never went to market um, it was a two-channel product it uh, it only measured at that time 122 db of dynamic range and 116 of thd and the magic number was 120 we had this goal of 120 so the product was never released and then we did an eight channel version of, of this standalone multi-level hyperstream at that time, 64 levels. And um, that got codenamed the 9008, just because two channels were two, eight, that was 9008. And that one did reach the 120 threshold. And so that became the original eight channel Sabre DAC, once we put a name on it. Uh, the 9006 or sorry the 9008s i think we released that at ces of 08 i think is when that one was actually sent out so that kind of gives a little bit about um you know how this company here kind of got, got into the audio dac business it really was because we were integrating class d drivers that turned mm -hmm. into DAC, DACs for line outs inside the dvd platform and those chips were they were going out so fast in those years, we could turn the design in, in two months. We get wow. something that didn't work. There was basically a free next silicon shuttle to run the chips on. So there was a lot of very quick rep repetitive learning going on in those years from around 2003, four, five, and all the way up to eight when we released the first one. We probably had, I, I'm gonna take a guess here, but I wanna say there's probably 16, maybe even 20 revisions. Wow. Wow. And, and most of them were layout and that's it's it's not the actual fundamental architecture layout is where really the thing is either made or broken it's uh -huh. yeah. probably relate to that in 
in the PC oh, yeah. level stuff because we we see the same things too for even our evaluation boards. For sure, that's cool. Do you do you guys have the have the ability to prototype that stuff in house, or does that get sent out to get done and then come back to you? How does that work? Well, we are a fabulous semiconductor company, so um, right here I've, I've got a wafer um, of one of these chips, and so I'll just kind of. Keep it in this very uh, secure box here because you don't want to drop it. <laughs> but um, you know, this this here is a wafer with many chips. I don't know if you can kind of see. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can sort of get an idea of how small these are. Holy uh, moly! Eight-inch wafer. We, we use eight-inch wafers, and these get diced up and packaged. So th this is this is actually our first A to D chip that uh, we didn't end up going to market with. Uh, from years from years back, but um, they're all very similar. So we don't actually build the wafers; we we get them fabricated with our partners. And, uh -huh. But the way it works, I'm just going to do that here and try not knock it over. Um, the way it works is we actually do all of the design here in Kelowna, um, as far as the digital design. So we write RTL to describe a bunch of the digital gates for the upsampling filters, the modulators themselves on how we noise shape. And I've got a whole bunch of slides that I can show you guys and I've kind of prepared for, um, you know, this type of meeting to, to, to show and it's a good opportunity to show that. And, um, and then the analog design. So to interface our digital design, which we prototype on FPGAs, but then there's the custom analog layout, laid out parts of which are all designed and um, laid out here in Kelowna in the group that we have here. We then send off what is called a GDS, and that GDS is effectively the blueprints. So there's 30 odd layers, depending on which process, but give or take, and those go to a fabrication company. They build the silicon wafers, and we get those wafers shipped to a packaging house. Packaging house wire bonds them all up and sends them to us, and then we have the chips in our lab here. We do the kind of pre-qualification make sure all the target specs are met or when they don't work, see how we can polish around them. That's, that's kind of what happens here and there. Uh -huh. Or do we actually have to make a change um, where we would go back and modify the wafers or some of the masks and to fix some parameter. And eventually once it's met all the spec, what will happen is we'll then kind of start talking to the customers or the, um, you know, the world do a press release and say, you know, here we've now got engineering samples you want to try. And so that's sort of the process, but it is all done here in Kelowna. And then once we kind of sign off on the um, building of the chip itself or the, the first prototypes, then what happens is our group down in San Jose will kind of take over the production. And we're for the most part out of it with the exception of supporting design ends for new customers. And there's, you know, that's a process in and of itself. Yeah, wow, that's that's super cool. You mentioned um, RTL. Is that a programming language that you use? I I'm, I don't yeah. know what that means. Yes, it's uh, well, it, it is a type of programming. What it does is it describes the hardware. So um, a C program may is something that you would run on a piece of hardware like a microprocessor. Uh -huh. RTL is a description language that you can actually describe the processor itself. So, uh -huh. for example, you'll say I'm going to make a um, an ALU unit, so an arithmetic unit for a processor. And then I'm going to have these registers to store data. I'm going to have this memory structure over here. So it's actually describing the actual gates that get put down. And then a C program could run on those gates if, if you okay. had have some form of processor. And so for, for the ESS chips, we, we do custom RTL for describing the um, all of the interfaces. So let's take a DAC, for example. You have the serial interface, you bring the data in off the, you know, either SPDIF or I2S TDM type um, inputs. Uh -huh. So you decode that into um, some binary representation, PCM, and then that will be PCM at some sample rate, and then it'll go through some interpolation path. And um, I believe you guys even do your own interpolation filters talking with your uh, original founder there years back is my impression. But, um, you know, we, we take that data and we upsample it and 
we upsample it with various types of filtering uh, responses um, that suit the, the market need. They, they have different sound signatures. Uh, and, then, um, and then we pass it along to what we call the modulator section for short, but it's, um, you know, it's hyperstream modulator is really kind of ESS's sort of patented way of doing a noise shaper. And, um, and then those noise shape bits, which really what that does is it, it takes say a 32 bit word at some high rate and it brings it down to a six bit word at that, um, at that same high rate. But what it does is it moves all the quantization noise outside of the band of interest. For our application, we move it into a high band so that the reconstruction filter in the analog section, which is effectively a low pass filter, filters it all out. And what you're left with in the audio band of interest, which would be anywhere up to about say three or 400 kilohertz, um, that would be left as very high resolution. And I have some, uh, I'll kind of give some graphics on that because I know oh, cool. words, it might be a little bit hard to sort of visualize that um, first yeah. time. I remember when noise shaping was being described to me by Martin the first time, and I went home and uh, banged my head on it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. But eventually, I'm still banging. yeah, eventually it started making sense. And then when you when you spend your whole career working on these things, it, it, it now now I I think I get them. But every once in a while, they throw you for a new trick. It's like, how does that even work? <laughs> yeah, that is amazing. That's uh. That's super cool to see the inner workings of, of a, you know, a technology like that. Yeah. yeah um, well, I can't show you all the details, but I can show you some kind of ge generic. Yeah. Stuff. Show us some cool stuff. It's, gonna... so, so let me just share the screen here and I'll go through some, uh, some of the slides I've prepared for you guys. Okay. Are you guys able to see the thing? I'm going to move to my other monitor here. Yeah. That's this great. All... Okay. So um, I'm going to go, let's see, is it, yeah. I'm going to just go through this and we can go as fast and as slow as you guys want, because I do have quite a few slides here, but um, I'm going to go through some DAC stuff and then I'm going to talk about some A to D stuff. And then some of the technologies we're actually working on in, um, you know, in doing signal processing that's built inside, built into our, some of our existing a to D and D to A chips and, and some of the future ones and then what we're doing with. But the first topic, hyperstream versus Delta Sigma. This question gets asked time and time again. Every single time I went to an audio show, trade show, remember when we could do those back then? Oh, yeah, yeah, back, back in <laughs> the day. days. <laughs> yeah. So and this question was, it was all the time. And, and so I, I've been, I've given this presentation all over the world. Um, and to over in its various stages, it's sort of morphed over time. So the first time I gave a presentation, I think I got a lot of glassy eyes and I thought, okay, I better change that. Um, <laughs> of it. And, and I read it, I reread it uh, a couple of years back at the original one. I was like, no wonder they didn't understand. I don't even know what this is talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll just talk about some other um, technologies that we've put in that may or may not be uh, directly um, you know, interesting to a high-end company, but uh, they are for more cost-effective type solutions. So we are trying to meet the overall market, still have some very high-end pieces, but also realize that not everyone can afford spending, you know, hundreds of dollars on the output stage or, or even the power supply or even the clocks. Um, right. And, and so we have to kind of make do with uh, various price points. And yep. Price points on our silicon are not like price points on end products. They're uh, they're they're very tight on some of them. So we got to be quite creative. Yep. So here um, I'm gonna try explain hyperstream versus delta sigma and why it why it does it. So um, really, what the hyperstream started out was I, I alluded to it before. It was a it's a noise shape pulse width modulator. So um, pulse width modulation is used in class D quite a bit, uh, almost all the time, in fact. Um, there are some other topologies out there that manufacturers use, but um, what effectively it does is you have this carrier rate, um, typically around 400 kilohertz, and you just modulate 
the duty cycle. So how much of it is high versus how much of it is low in that 400 kilohertz um, you know, period, it's our frequency. So the, that period there, how much do you want high, how much do you want low? And the, if you low pass filter that, um, you can imagine if you were three quarters high and one quarter low, if you low pass filter that sufficiently, your audio signal would be three quarters. If you were half high, half low, and you filtered that out, um, with a, enough of a low pass filter, which effectively is some kind of an averaging type filter, if you can think of that, the average is 50 50, or so if it's 50 50, the average is 50%. And then when it's more low than high, the average is low. And that's how you actually create a sine wave. You, you go to having a very high average in, at the peak of the sine wave to a at the middle of the sine wave at zero crossing, it's 50 50. And then when you get to the bottom, it's very low. And um, the, there's two ways to do that. One is you can have PWM or the other one is you can have PDM. So PDM stands for pulse density modulation. Mm -hmm. And that's what Delta Sigma is. So with pulse density modulation, what'll happen is, is that when it's very, the frequency of the edges isn't, isn't necessarily constant. So PDM in the middle or, or Delta Sigma, um, when it's in the middle, and I hope you can see the mouse here, yep. but, so you can imagine the sine wave is actually going to go this way. So this is peak amplitude positive, peak amplitude negative. It could have, could have drawn it the other way, but um, on the side. But when when you have PDM, what happens is when you're doing an average of 50-50, it's just going one zero one zero one zero one zero at whatever clock you have. And this is what DSD is too. DSD is a PDM type format. Um, so um, it's it's actually got a fairly high switching frequency. It's actually the clock over two, one zero one zero. But now if you go down to say um, say uh, I don't know uh, seventy five percent, we'll call this positive. So what it'll do is it'll go one 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 zero one 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 zero. So the frequency of that actually went down because you're no longer switching a one to a zero back to a one every two clocks. It now takes four clocks to create that. And then as you get closer and closer to say 100% modulation or the top of the sine wave, imagine if you want to make 90%, you need nine ones and then one zero. So now you're, now you're actually, your switching frequency has gone down from doing a complete um, up and down in two clocks to taking 10 clocks. And the same occurs on the other side. And so what happens with that is that the rise and fall edges, that's what this RF is um, uh -huh. for. The rise and fall edges are, are not um, you know, constant. And what they are is they're correlated to the actual output amplitude, the instantaneous output amplitude. And now look what happens when you get a, um, like a PDM or Delta Sigma or even DSD. Uh, what happens is that no edge is perfect. So here you're saying, yeah, it's a zero and it's a one. You got your two binary levels and you have this instantaneous transition, but that's, that's not how it works. It takes- yeah, theoretical, yeah. Right. It, yeah, it takes some time to get from a one, or sorry, from a zero up to a one. And then it also takes some time. So this is kind of grossly drawn. I think I drew this in Microsoft Paint, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, probably 15 years ago. But what, what the point is, is that there's an actually, all this error, this error has occurred because this is imperfect. So it didn't right. actually get all the way to one. And so if you average this all out, it doesn't, it doesn't actually quite look the same. Now, when you have, say if you if you're at 50, 50, you're going one, zero, one, zero. If your rise and fall times were matched, you'd be okay because the amount that you lost on your rise, you'd gain back on your fall for the most part. But so even if they're matched, you'd be okay for that one particular thing. But if they're mismatched, then you actually have a little bit of error that is correlated with that instantaneous amplitude. Now, imagine when you have this pattern where you're going, say, uh, two thirds, you go one, one, zero, one, one, zero. Well, see, in between here, you didn't end up in incurring that error because it stayed high. And so this this um, pattern here has a different error given in per unit time than this pattern. Mm -hmm. and because it has a different error per unit time, that and that per unit time is correlated to the actual instantaneous amplitude of your sine wave. That translates to a harmonic distortion. And because it's correlated 
to the fundamental, the fundamental being the sine wave you're driving. So you're, the error that the PDM type um, interface introduces is a function of your um, input amplitude, which means that it will harmonically relate. And so the hyperstream, what it did was it fixed that number of edges. And that's what, uh, that's what PWM does. And, and that's why class D uses a lot of PWM if, it's, if it doesn't have any other type of analog correction to it to, to account for those errors is, um, is to address that fact. Now, the hyperstream itself, again, suffers from rise and fall times being mismatched. But because the rise and fall mismatch is at a constant frequency, this blue line here is trying to show that no matter what the output amplitude is, you always have this constant error. For the PDM, where the output amplitude has the most error at the, at the middle when it's got a high frequency of edges, remember the one zero one zero one zero, it's got an error every single time. As I get closer and closer to 100%, it's going one, 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 and then a zero, and then a one, 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 and then a zero. So there's actually a relatively small amount of error because you don't get these errors here. Another term for this in other parts of um, electronics is called intersymbol interference. And so that's, that, that's another way of looking at this. That, that is what this really is, just kind of broken out and applied to audio. And what that translates to here is that we have either a constant error. And if you have a constant error, what that does is it gives you a slight DC offset on your output. That, and now that DC offset, let's go put it in relative terms, that DC offset, if, if you have an analog section that's capable of doing maybe 80 dB of distortion without any type of correction, you know, that's one part in 10,000. So if you have that, all of that 80 dB of error as distortion, you can hear it. Your brain goes and like, okay, I can hear the distortion. But if it's a DC offset, that just gets removed out of the audio experience. It's, um, it's, it's uh, for the most part, it can be trimmed out on the later end because we take differential and they're usually matched pretty good or that DC offsets in the order of 100 microvolts. So 100 microvolts of DC offset um, doesn't hurt anybody except for um, yeah. earphones. I didn't even but, see that, yeah. Yeah, so and so what, what we've done is we've moved the error in the analog section with this hyperstream patent to all stick it, all this, what would normally be harmonic distortion, we lumped it all at DC. So we push a bunch of it down to DC and then we noise shape the noise up in high frequency. So get it out of our 20 to 20 K or now we 20 to 400 K is what we kind of look at as the audio band. Um, 20 Hertz to about 400 kilohertz is what we kind of consider the audio band these days and, um, and move it out of those ranges. So that's, well, that's that's super cool. So for for yeah. just just as a summary for for people watching, basically because with the with the hyperstream technology, you have a have a constant air, you can account for that and pull that harmonic distortion out of the audio band and eliminate it. Yeah, it it moves it because it's constant. It no longer will move with the frequency, so it just shows up as DC, which is a constant. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that is super cool. So, so that was the, uh, you know, that that was kind of the start of it, and and really this was all born out of doing the class D um, embedded um, drivers that we were uh -huh. doing way back in the DVD days. Um, so I've got another one that I I wanted to show. So hyperstream versus hyperstream two. Okay. So. The hyperstream was the original 9008, and then um, and also the 9018s, which was a very popular chip for us, 2008 and 2009. And then um, then the next kind of generation came along with what we called the K2M. Now the, the K2M series, we and that was actually targeted for mobile audio, um, hi-fi mobile audio, and so. In those years and all the feedback we got on the uh, 9008 and then the 9018 and it's and it's uh, little brothers, the 9006 and the 9016s, but those are effectively in the same family. Um, we, we, we got a lot of feedback in those first years, a lot of stuff we didn't really even know and you know there were problems that we'd resolved over the years and oh, 
we'd see issues. We'd get alerted to issues by manufacturers that were using our chips saying, well, what about this? And it's like, oh yeah, what about that? <laughs> that. So Hyperstream 2 came along mm -hmm. and that was trying to address some of those things. And so um, there, there were a few things. So three main points distinguish the difference. And, and I get this question a lot too. What is the difference Hyperstream 1, Hyperstream 2? Because it's in our literature, but we, you know, we, we didn't really talk about it a whole lot. We just sort of said, well, it's number two, it's better. Because um, in, in those days, we were very fearful that we were still fairly new to the game in hi-fi audio. If we kind of told everybody what we did, we kind of had this view that maybe they would uh, go and copy us. But I just don't right. think it's the case. I think, I think everyone wants to make their own way of doing things anyways. Um, so um, three points. So quantizer linearization. Um, and I, I've got a slide to kind of show how, what that is. And then um, transient response, and then um, DEM. So this DEM is dynamic element matching. This is yet another kind of piece of the puzzle to making a uh, noise shape uh, modulator DAC or A to D that will perform high. So I, I've got a graph on each of these. So I'll just go into the quantizer linearization. So the way I've found is the best way to describe it is to show an image and so in the original hyperstream we had a noise shaped quantizer and the quantizer what that really did is it took the 32 bits of data that we'd upsampled from the original input stream and then we chopped it down to six bits 64 levels and chopping it down to six bits ends up with an error so you can imagine that your image if you had like a 24 bit per pixel grayscale this is this is kind of grotesque just to show the point. And this goes down to one bit per pixel. But this is quantizing it. It's saying, is it basically more than half more than like half the brightness or not? And then you end up with this image. Mm -hmm. And then in in the um, the same thing applies in audio. So actually all of the processing in audio is is basically a one-dimension version of video processing. Even, even sample rate converters are simply just scalars, but in one direction instead of two. Um, but um, so this, so you can really, so it's very analogous. So this quantizer, what we did is we added dither. Um, and what dither does to a quantizer is it, it actually linearizes its gain. And um, that does a bunch of stuff to the noise shape loop itself, but the way to think of it or to visualize it is just to look at this picture. Now, this picture is still only black and white. There's no grayscale levels in between. It's either all on or all off. Mm -hmm. But when you dither it, what, what it does is it allows it to get you an a, a much better average in a local space to the original image than, than the one up here does. You see, right. this laser here just kind of tosses it out and it doesn't linearize it, it's gone. So it, whether it's 51% um, black and it would just go straight to black or it's 90% black, it goes to black. Where here, what it does is it sort of keeps a little bit of spatial memory like or in time and it goes, okay, I was a little bit off last time. Keep that little bit of error, accumulate that error and change it a little bit. So by linearizing the quantizer, what you end up with is the ability to have a better overall representation with the same number of levels. And so that's what hyper, that was one of the main changes between Hyperstream 1 and Hyperstream 2. Wow, that, that, that picture is really descriptive of that technology. That's a cool way to show it. Yeah, and it's, it's not exactly like that, but it gives you the main idea for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, and, and it, really, it really helped me when I was you know, working with these things to, to get a visual to really understand it. it. It's, I didn't go back after and just do this. I was like, I wonder if it's the same and it sure enough it is. Yeah. Wow. Really interesting. And then one of the other things that uh, we, we did on the, um, from the one modulator to the other is um, there's always a trade-off. Um, the bandwidth of the modulator will determine how fast it is, how fast it will respond. So it's kind of like the, you know, modulator is really a low pass filter with just a quantizer stuck around the feedback. Um, at least these type of modulators are. Mm -hmm. And so the wider you can get your input to output bandwidth, the faster the impulse or the step response shown here will come through. And 
ideally what you want is you want it just to come up do a perfect step and go straight across. And if you had infinite bandwidth, in theory, that's what it would do. But it, you know, it doesn't sure. doesn't have infinite bandwidth. But the the I, the point is is that the higher bandwidth you can have and and settle to this settle to a the accurate level um, at the I guess the end of the step, the faster you can do that, the more ideal it approaches. So we we pushed it a little bit. So the original hyperstream was. It's a little bit slower and it uh, it had a bit of a response like this and we, we pushed it a little bit harder and we got it to, to go a little bit up and a little bit down. And so when you filter it out, um, you see what happened here is that we got a little bit up and a little bit down and less up. So the average of this is quicker to be, or I guess it's faster to be correct. If you, uh -huh. if you can imagine that you average all of this this stuff out, it takes longer for this one to settle to the final value. Because because what this is, is this is showing the actual bits that are coming out of our DAC. And then they'll go on to a analog stage in a product of, like yours with, um, you know, what whatever circuitry that the, you know, you guys use or any other of our customers use mm -hmm. to effectively just smooth all this out and filter it out. And you never see these steps because the bandwidth of the post stage is so much lower. Right. But the point is, is that the average of this one settles to the correct response quicker than this one does. And so, so basically we were opening up the bandwidth to, to make it faster. Kind of like, if you think about it this way, kind of like how um, 96K has a better transient response than 44K or DSD has a much better transient response than both of those because it just has a higher bandwidth. So that's what uh, that's what's being shown here. Okay. Cool. Um, so this one, dynamic element matching. So so I've mentioned this six bits and sixty four levels. So when we go from say a thirty two bit signed value and modulate that down to a six bit value, that's binary. So six bits to the six is sixty four. So you can represent that those six. Um, levels or those six binary levels with 64 unary weighted uh, pieces, which is what we do. And this is what this is what most manufacturers do, um, or at least some kind of blend of this with some binary weighting. But um, what we what we have is we have a whole bunch of single bit DACs. And the reason why single bit DACs are great is because there's only two points, and you can always draw a straight line between two points. And a straight line doesn't have any high order terms which means it has no distortion. Uh -huh. As long as what you drive each of those two level DACs is, is something that doesn't have the rise fall mismatch error we talked about before. So each one of these, and there's 64 of them in some of our products, there's 32 in some other of our products, but um, generally it's 64. Each one of these is being driven with another hyperstream modulator. So every one of those guys is individually getting the low distortion signal to drive it. And then what we do is we go and add them all back up. And then that creates this kind of six bit quantized level. And then what, what has to happen is now we've drawn it here as we've got these one bit DACs and then we kind of add them all up. And the way we add up the, add them up is we add them up with a resistor manifold inside our chips. And that basically adds up these buffers that are driving this. Um, it just basically does a summing point and that output is what comes out of our chip. And so if we have all of these go to the VREF, it pulls all those resistors high. If they all go down to the V ground, they all go low. If half of them are high and half are low, it's the middle point. And so how we modulate driving these guys determines what the output signal is. And so this plot here is showing if you were to scope our DAC output directly, you would see this blue line. And then if you were to filter it with some post analog filter, you'd see it kind of get smoothed out. And here's kind of a zoom in showing that, uh, that kind of um, process where we have a lot of density of ones. So the average starts going higher and then we have a lot of density, a little bit lower, it goes lower. So the, the overall sum of these things looks like a multi-bit PDM again, but it's built up of a bunch of single bit PWM or PWM noise shaped or hyperstream. 
So because what we do is at the on the front end, we don't have any distortion being put in. You come through these resistors, other than some other artifacts with silk polysilicon resistors, there's no distortion added. So if there's no distortion added at the output, then the sum, you know, the output is is truly the sum of its parts, sort of. So now imagine if each of these resistors didn't match perfectly. Um, so if this one was say, a, if this first one was say one, but this one was 1.01 and this one was 0.99 and that happens in um, fabrication process, you don't have perfect matching. So if, if you did nothing about that, you would end up with a large level of distortion because each of these each of these bits are responsible for the next step on our total output. Like you could you could probably imagine that if each of these steps weren't equal, like imagine trying to go up some stairs and they're all kind of not the same height, um, you, you would end up with a very poor output. You'd, you'd fall if you're on the stairs, and if if these steps weren't perfectly uniform, what would it, what it would represent is a transfer function that had high order terms. Again, that would translate into distortion. Because you know, down here you might step too much and then a little bit. So if you looked at the transfer function, it wouldn't be a straight line. Even though on the input to each these guys, they each had a straight line, but they got weighted differently to the final sum. So how do you deal with that? Because you can't make these things match perfectly. You can get them to about 80 dB of matching inside a chip. So 0.01% matching. That's about what you can get. Um, and and um, the you need some kind of dynamic element match technique, which effectively what you're trying to do is you're trying to scramble which one of these resistors you assign to every one of these DACs, but in a non-correlated way to the signal so that that scrambling ends up not being part of the signal itself. It's, it's like noise compared to the signal. There's no correlation. So this dynamic element matching, this is part of, um, part of the ESS's Sabre DAC kind of sauce, our, our way of doing it, we've found a way to actually take the individual pieces, remap them on the fly all the time. Every single clock, we rechange the order of these guys around compared to these guys, which each have their own hyperstream modulator. And what it does is it moves all of that air up into some high frequency. And it appears, if you look at on the uh, spectrum analyzer, you can see the 80 dB down air. It's just at four megahertz or six megahertz. It's not in the audio band. So we push that error of the mismatch all the way out of the audio band. Wow, that's brilliant. That, <laughs> that is really, really amazing. And it, was, it was a long, it was many years of, of doing it. And there was a lot of smart people involved in, you know, helping out design this stuff. and. You know, it's, this was definitely uh, took a long time to get there, but <laughs> right, and we're we're still we're still learning on this thing. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it'll go on for a long time. And yeah, just, yeah, I know. Just like we're doing new chips now, and we're still oh, there's more we can do. Oh yeah, so. that's that's the cool thing about it. Just watching what you've done, you know, over these over these years with these products and seeing the changes in these. These cool things you've discovered between hyperstream and hyperstream two and the the DEM and that's I I love it. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this plot here is it. What this is showing is one of the ways we used to deter to basically prove that we fixed. Um, and, and this particular one is the dither one. So th this is dynamic element match and dither. So uh, in the original hyperstream, we you can see that we had these errors. And what would happen is this, this is 130, this is 132. So right at the center point, so this is, imagine what this is. This is your output sine wave. And again, this is going up on the sine wave up to 0.9 full scale and down to minus 0.9. And what we do here is we, it's called dynamic range versus DC offset. So you put a 60 dB down tone in, and if you're at zero offset, that's how everyone measures dynamic range. You A weight it and you get rid of all the rest of the stuff and you see what your ratio of the rest of the noise is compared to the full scale. 
And then, but what happens if you start adding a fixed DC offset to it? So say if I put in um, 10%, so 100 millis, 10% um, DC offset, what happened to the dynamic range or 0 0.2, 0 0.25 even, or even half of full scale? So this, this plot takes quite a while to run. It, I think this is, this, this point, I do think this is about a three hour run on the audio precision. You just step it by a small amount, re-get it, plot it. I, I think there was 50,000 points on this plot. Wow. I just, I just let it go overnight. And because I wanted to get the high resolution, the, the stepping that we could um, and make sure that we're not missing anything. Because what we found, and we were actually alerted to it by some manufacturers said, hey, um, I'm purposely putting in a DC offset for, because I think they had a class A output stage and they wanted to offset something. I, I can't remember the exact reasons, but they wanted to offset the data. And they're like, our dynamic range is not very good. And I thought, wow, what do you mean it's not good? <laughs> <laughs> but sure enough, went and set it up like that and say like, oh yeah and so that was one of the uh we need a hyper stream too guys <laughs> that, that was that was one of them and so this plot here is showing some of the competitors of you know we do the exact same test on on some of the other manufacturers parts one from the you know each of the uh each of the big guys and um showing what what happened so right in the middle you know they all kind of looked good mm -hmm. um, but as you veer from the middle you know, if the dynamic range changes, what that really means is that your noise floor is moving up and down. It's pumping with your audio signal. Mm -hmm. And that you can actually hear that effect. Or, and, and another way of thinking is imagine that you're riding on a low frequency tone, such as a bass drum hit, and you have your cymbals, a very high frequency tone, but, um, or maybe not even cymbals, but something light in the background and higher frequency that was riding on that sine wave. Now the resolution of that has been lost because your noise floor has instantaneously changed. But when, when the machines measure it, they don't measure it like that in real time. They measure a periodic steady state all centered around zero. They only ever look along this vertical axis. So, you know, at straight shot, like this is this level here is 120 and this is 130. Like these all appear to be quite good. But if you go up here, like this graph starts at 100 dB. So going from you know, 120 down to 100, that's, that's a factor of 10 times worse um, just on how you measure it. And this is more representative of what an audio signal does in real time when you're listening to it. And then, and then um, you know, this one I would argue would actually be fairly good because you, it would just have a higher noise floor, but the noise floor is constant with right. amplitude. That, I think right. that the idea is you want a horizontal one as low as possible. Uh -huh. and so nothing's, you know, none of them are perfect. You can have horizontal, but perfectly flat, or you can have um, some that have a very um, strong dependence on the offset, or you can have ones that actually have a very heavy amount of nonlinearity in them. And, and then if they're, and then the fact that they don't, they're not very symmetric, shows that the top side of the sine wave ex is exposed to something different than the bottom side, which is quite interesting. I have yeah. no idea what would cause that, but um, that's, you know, this was just applying that metric. So this is, this is a metric we've used over the years to qualify when we, when we go and do something um, to our modulator to try and prove it, or we make a next generation thing, we go and run this test. And if this, test shows that it goes above our previous ones, we don't do anything with it. And that's one test, but it's um, it's one test that's quite informative right away. And so that's, that's that one. Dude. Yeah. Right. Yeah, now, and the, and the 9038 Pro, I'm pretty sure we have the, the commercial debut of that, of that part in the QX5 that I yeah. think we debuted at Munich. Yeah. I remember people telling us there's no way we had the 9038 Pro yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah Gary, do you have different topics you want to touch on? Um, well, we well, yeah, I, mean, I just want to kind of, yeah, but I just kind of want to, you, you know, um, with all that background, you know, on on the kind of high level of the ESS dash, I'm going to kind of jump back a little bit and just kind of talk about like how, how AIR specifically uses, which is, you know, you know, um, 
in a way that, you know, you know, we, you know, we use ESS DAX um, where we actually, we use the modulator, um, you know, and, yeah. um, you, you know, and we, and we essentially bypass most of those other features that are, you know, um, that are great in the ES DAX, ES DAX, but, you know, but at least in our products, you know, a lot of our secret sauce, we want to impart. So, so all of our own power supplies and our clocking and our analog stage, and um, as well as all our own interpolation and upsampling filters that we do externally. And so most often the way we use your DAC is that um, we bypass most of that and essentially use, um, you know, the really high performance modulator. Yeah, 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 that, yeah, I'm fully, uh, fully aware of that. We, but it actually with, um, that that was kind of something that in the original one, um, I, I believe when I first met Charlie, he, he said he, he wanted to use the chip, but he wouldn't use it unless he could bypass the internal filter. Yep. And, yeah. and I said, that's no problem. Um, but uh, you can't do that in the existing chip, but I was, it was at CES one of the years or no, it was at Rocky mountain audio show. It was at the Rocky mountain show. And, um, he said, I need to be able to bypass it. And we happen to be just taping out our next tape out is when we send off our masks, our design to go get fabric fabricated. Mm -hmm. um, so we were just at the tape out stage. And so I, I called back at the audio show and I said, can we put a bypass bit from this to this? And, and the digital engineer that was on it, he's just like, I called him during working hours and he goes from here to here, here to here. And on that phone call, he's like, it's done. <laughs> Wow. And then, and Charlie's sitting there, and he just looks at me like, "Who are you?" <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe Charlie was one of the first people to say, if not the first, "I want to bypass the ASRC completely. I want everything synchronous." Yep. And that is, I was like, "Yeah, we can bypass that." And so we put those bypass bits in, so that you, so that manufacturers can tailor the the sound signature to exactly what they want because. Right. It does sound different. Cool. Well, uh, Dustin, thanks a lot for joining us today. This has been super interesting. Um, I've learned a ton. I, I, I think this the presentation was, was excellent. So um, really appreciate you being on board with us. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. And anyone out there, if you have questions, email us at pintsatair.com. Uh, we'll be happy to get back to you if you have ideas. Um, and uh, keep a lookout online for completely empty uh, pint glasses uh, from on our storefront. Um, until then, everyone take care and cheers. Cheers. <laughs>